Meetings call to order. <coughs> All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, roll call. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Here. Mr. LeMay? Here. Mr. Morin? Yeah. Mr. Tatius? Here. Mr. Giggy? Here. Mr. O'Hare? Here. Mr. Bahu? Here. Okay, uh, Mr. LeMay, is there anybody registered to speak for this meeting? There's no one signed in, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, school, communi school committee communications, are there any? Okay, there are none. Um, and now this is our time for the report of a student representative. Uh, we have a new student rep um, this year. Uh, her name's Victoria Gibbs. She's a resident of Lowell, Massachusetts, as I am. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> she is a 12th grade, she's a senior, and she's in um, painting and design. We're excited to have you. Thank you for volunteering Thank for this position. You. We're always excited to find out what goes on, you know, amongst the student body because we don't get to, to, to attend everything. So, you know, we'll give you, we'll turn this meeting over to you and let's find out a little bit about yourself. Thank you. And we, both people call it P&D. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman and fellow committee members. My name is Victoria Gibbs and I'm honored to be this year's student representative. I'm a senior in the painting design program and I'm also in the National Technical Honor Society. This year, I am gr the Greater Lowell Chapter of Skills USA's historian. As historian, I am responsible for taking photos and creating a scrapbook to so showcase the events and activities that we participate in as an officer team together. My involvement with SkillsUSA doesn't stop there. I'm also competing in the community service competition this year. I'm working with another student, Maria Vicente, to create, to create a bedroom makeover for a child with cancer in honor of our fellow peer, Shelby Murphy. I am so lucky to be involved in this organization organization that gives me the opportunity to make someone's day just a little bit brighter. After high school, I plan on attending college with a major in photography in preparation to one day become a fashion photographer. And now on to the information about our organizations and clubs. On September 12th, 20 of our student leaders volunteered their time at the 15th annual Drake It Old Home Day celebration to provide free face painting for children. On September 13th, Greater Lowell students volunteered at the Duval Senior Center for their annual Stepping Out for Seniors Walkathon and a carnival. Students volunteered to run the carnival games, hand out cotton candy, ice cream, and popcorn, and also provided free face painting. The sophomore class committee and the dance team will be volunteering to assist the Merrimack Valley Food Bank's annual pantry raid on September 23rd and September 26th. Students will drop off bags at houses in the Pawtucketville neighborhood and pick up the donations to bring to the food bank. The outing club is in the process of planning their first trip. They're hoping to go apple picking in Groton in September. Class elections will be held the week of September 21st to October 2nd. We have a number of students who are running for class officer positions that are really excited for the year to start getting ready to get involved. Our annual, our annual Canopy Lake Scream Fest trip will be taking place on October 6th. Students will stay after school and enjoy pizza and a movie and then head off to Canopy Lake for the night. Anime Club Student Council, Environmental Green Club, Project Purple, and the Drama Club are all holding their first meetings this week. For athletics, fall sports saw 457 <coughs> student athletes try out for a team, up to 380 in the fall of 2014. Varsity football opened the season with a 20 to 8 win over Lowell Catholic, which is their very first victory over <coughs> Lowell Catholic in four seasons. The team travels to Manchester, Essex on Friday, September 18th for their next game. The JV team also opened with a win, defeating Lowell Catholic by a score of 52 to 6. While the freshman team dropped a tough decision 
24 to 22 to Whittier Tech. Varsity boys soccer is undefeated on the young season, checking in with two wins and a tie so far. They plan, they play next at Traditional League Power Chelsea High School on September 18th. The girls soccer team has played strong so far this season and will look to pick up their first victory when they, when they face Mystic Valley at home on September 22nd. Varsity girls volleyball picked up an early win over Essex Tech on September 11th. They next play on September 18th at Whittier Tech. The cross country teams will open up the season on September 16th versus Whittier Tech before heading to a punk a punkwit high school for the big wave in, in invasional meet on September 19th. The cheer team has been working hard to prepare for competition the competition season this fall while also providing support for the football team during game days. For other news, the summer program at the summer program over 100 incoming freshmen and student leaders attended the 2015 summer program held at St. Michael's High School in Lowell. The project-based theme was education around the globe. Students presented their research-based projects on the last day to family and friends. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Victoria, thank you. That was that was great work. Thanks for all the information. There's a lot happening here in yeah, September, there isn't is. there? You know, we look forward to having you back. Thanks for really emphasizing that large score of 52 to 6 to our, <laughs> you know, college, or our football team won. Hopefully you'll be able to emphasize some um, state championships as well. Hopefully. <laughs> Thanks again for coming. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, um, now we're off to the um, approval of minutes um, from August 20, 2015. Uh, motion by Mr. Morin, second by Mr. Tatsius. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Bajo? Yes. And to the approval of warrants, um, we have warrants for the uh, amount of uh, $5,475,468.79. Yes. Okay, waive the reading by Mr. Morin. We seconded by Mr. Booten. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, now an approval for the um, move to uh, approve the warrants. Motion by Mr. Morin, seconded by Mr. Tatsius. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Okay, there's no report from our general counsel tonight, so we'll move on to our, a report from our superintendent director, Mr. Roger Bourgeois. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, to begin my report. The first item on my report, I'd just like to introduce um, Two new administrators, uh, one of them started July 1st and the other one's gonna start October 1st. So we have with us tonight, uh, Tracy Encanasio. Tracy is our new Director of Guidance. Uh, Tracy comes to us after having served as Director of Guidance K-12 for the Haverhill Public Schools and prior to that she, she worked as a Guidance Counselor. And uh, Billy Joe Turner comes to us after serving as the Chief Financial Officer for the Boston Renaissance Charter School. Uh, for the last five years, and then prior to that, she was a budget analyst with the Lowell Public Schools. So, so welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. I've also um, asked some of our staff members to be here just to. I know that um, out of state, tra out of New England travel, we we get approved by this uh, group. So um, I was asked by the chairman uh, to just ask. Uh, somebody, uh, some people to come just to give us a report. I know you approved the travel uh, for some very valuable PD. And I just want to make sure that you're seeing the, uh, the fruits of that uh, labor. So Christine Messina, you approved the trip to Washington, D.C. for her. So she's going to come up and, uh, and give you a, a little bit of a report on her trip. Yes. Um, 
As you know, Christine's our LPN director as well as our adult education director. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, it was the I went to um, Washington D.C. for the NLN, which is the National League of Nursing um, PN Education Initiative, and this was the first of any of its kind. Um, they're they're trying to make sure that the PN education stays. Um, viable and now they're trying to it's just they were reaching out to um, the directors across the country and I was one of five that went and they From Massachusetts right? Massachusetts yeah. excuse me <laughs> there was 50 there and they actually um, recognized Massachusetts for all the the work that we've done and we're so far ahead of other states and I'm also part of that because of the um, Massachusetts coalition that I belong to so it was really, it was, it was really empowering. It was awesome. Okay, Mr. Espinola, um, just curious. I probably hmm? won't even understand when you say it. Okay. Um, you said you're so, uh, we are so far, Massachusetts. Yes. Is so far ahead of yes. the other states. Um, in what? And, and like, um, because I think that's important okay. to um, um, uh, react to that and, and let us know like uh, well are we so good okay <laughs> okay um, the Robert Wood um, Johnson Foundation has put a lot of money into um, the it's an IOM report or whatever but it's a matter of trying to get um, academic progression looking at how they can make more nurses become BSNs so I'm part of this to make sure that the LPNs also have a, a say. So um, they have um, oh my goodness, state competencies that they devised for RNs. So now we are aligning the state competencies for the practical nurses so that when it comes to the table, we'll be able to say we're ready for this academic progression to a BSN level. And as far as that is concerned, where uh, Massachusetts is far ahead, of everybody else. Yes. Yep. And, and excuse my ignorance no, again. What is a BSN? Oh, bachelor's, bachelor science of nursing. Okay. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. I I think that's great. I'm I'm a first responder, and so isn't uh, uh, Mr. Lemay. So yeah. uh, we uh, I appreciate everything that nurses do. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. On a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah. I just wondered. You said uh, one of fifty. Mm -hmm. Is that just New England? Does it cover no, the whole United uh, States? United States. So is that like <clears throat> one from each? It, it was whomever signed up, but I mean Texas, and, and there were many. So it was capped off at 50 people? Yeah, it was capped off at 50. And so w will Greater Lowell gain from your participation in? Oh, definitely, and, definitely. I mean, I read, you know, what, what, what we're headed towards. Uh, yep. But, uh, Right, which we're already in the process of um, rewriting our program outcomes. Um, and then we've broken it down into term outcomes. And now we have to just keep bringing it down and uh, rewriting our curriculum or looking at it again. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. So, so I just want to mention um, that, that Christine is the administrator, oversees, and supervises, as far as I know, the largest LPN program in the state. We have 80, 80 uh, young people Vocational. in our program. Yep. Um, in addition to that, she also <laughs> has one of the highest passing rates for the, the LPN exam at the end of, of, uh, of the project, of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the year long course. So yep. she's doing a terrific yep. job. Really appreciate <coughs> that. Thank you. Yep. And Quite successful. Yes, it's fun. Very, very say, good. Um, I think I've heard through the streets that there's a waiting list. Is there a waiting list? <coughs> There's a few people on the waiting were on the waiting list by the It's not so much a school. waiting list as the standards to get into the program. It's they wouldn't even be on the waiting the, list at that a point. Lot of, a lot of people apply, but they don't have, they're not able to pass the admission standards to be able to get in the program. The reason for the admission standards are that if they don't have a level of academic expertise to be successful, then they're going to waste their money. They're just going to flunk out. So. Um, we try to steer them towards some remedial <coughs> courses so that they can get the, the math and the science background and the English background to be able to be successful. Okay. Then they can, they can go through and be tested again and apply again. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Messina, thank you. Oh, sorry, oh. Mr. Moore? One other thing, and I know it's quite successful and had a lot of friends come out of there, is uh, could, 
Could you give me like a course description? What what they do in there? Oh, throughout the whole ten months. Yeah, you know, uh, I'd like to see what it is. Is you know, okay. I realize they have to know their meds and they have to know all that. And just oh, sure. Um, we have different, like seven different courses well, first I mean, term. Is, uh, you want the it, specifics? Is, what I mean is, when when they apply, mm -hmm. they go through their interview process. Mm -hmm. They already must be aware that this is the criteria that they're going. What what is it they're going to be learning? Yes, they have so the like the curriculum. Curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Okay. It's mandated number of hours, correct? Yes, 1097. Yeah, and, and a certain number of classroom hours. They're and actually here clinicals. from what time till 10 o'clock at night? Two. Yeah, eight to, two, eight, eight to 2, 8 to 2.30, right? and then or, um, or <coughs> 4 to 10.30 at night. Yeah. yeah, and then a certain number of hours have to be clinical. 540, yeah. 540 where they're actually in the hospitals or the nursing yeah. homes. That's a pretty mm -hmm. rigorous program. Uh, Very rigorous, sure but... Um, we don't have our numbers for this past year, but the year before we had a 96% pass rate for the national exam. Uh, that's awesome. So, that's yeah. Right. That's outstanding. Uh, maybe uh, you could go ahead and furnish, up, furnish us with an LPN booklet for our next oh, meeting. Oh, sure. So we can maybe r r run our thumbs through it and take a look exactly oh, sure. what yep, the LPN no program is all about so that we yep. can share with our um, uh, members of our district. Okay. Um, Mr. Booten, you have a question? I just had a question because you were talking about aligning the LPN with the BSN, mm -hmm. Bachelor of Science in Nursing. How difficult is it for an LPN that graduates from here or anywhere to go to Middlesex for their ASN program, these associates? There's a, there's a real big waiting list. So when they go to Middlesex, they can take A&P and they can take some of the courses, but they can't be admitted into the actual nursing courses until there's openings okay. so I can't say that you know within two years you'll you'll graduate from Middlesex it all depends on when you get into the nursing component okay. thank you so the the kind of the the um, we had a f first graduating class not us but the there's an LPN to BSN program um, that was started in Worcester in Fitchburg it's the only one um, in the state that accepts 18 hours for credit hours if they pass these three exams. Okay. So you get 18 college credits just for being an LPN. So that's where mm -hmm. we're trying to get all the upper higher education um, to realize that this is kind of where the future needs to go. Thank you. Mr. Espinola? What are the alphabet letters you have there? Oh. Me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? Yeah. Oh, um, I have a master's in education and a master's in nursing. Nice. Good for you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rowe here. Uh, Kristen, I just want to tell you, in the past few <coughs> times I was in the hospital, uh, once in Lowell, that, you know, I, you depend so much on the nurse who is with you more than the doctor. And, and I, I have all the respect in the world for the, uh, the nurses. Uh, what I did notice is a lot of the nurses that uh, the RNs and MS people with masters, uh, some of them came from Greater Lowell Tech because I used to question them constantly. This last trip that I just got out of the hospital with, there were a lot of, which was not in Lowell, uh, there were some people from Lowell, but in other, um, uh, they weren't bedside uh, care nurses, they mm -hmm. were doing other things, and this was at the Leahy Clinic, but there were many people who were matriculating to UMass schools after. Yep. UMass Boston, UMass Lowell, and I think uh, someone else was framing out. I'm not too sure, but the okay. other two were very prominent in where they were, where the nurses came from. Of course, it's a little closer to to um, to Boston, and could be the reason. But mm -hmm. I have all the all the respect in the world. The doctor's going to fix you. The nurse is going to live with you and <laughs> tell you, you know, don't get uh, <laughs> don't get nervous. You know, you're going to make it out of here. You know, mm -hmm. and it's. And they're believable. So thank you. You're very welcome. Were they telling you that? They were telling me. No, actually, they said, we're happy when you're getting out of here. You know, that yeah. was <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Ms. Messina, yeah. thank you very okay. much for thank this report. Thanks. And uh, we appreciate your time. Okay. No, I thank you. I was very, very interested. Um, you also approved uh, professional development opportunity to for 
for up to 30 people. We actually had 28 people attend uh, Professional Learning Communities at Work Institute, um, which was held in Syracuse, New York, right, right adjacent to Syracuse University. Um, so the 28 of us um, went up uh, to Syracuse. Um, there's some information on uh, Professional Learning Community education reform model in your booklet. Um, basically, uh, what it is, is it's resources, it's about continuous improvement, and it's resources and experts who have turned schools around and had success and developed best practices, and really it's sharing it with um, the folks that go to the conference. So rather than me tell you too much more about it, I've asked uh, Sarah Wilkie and Jeff Albert to be here, and they're going to do a presentation for you. Uh, Arthur Cornelia, who's one of our um, Auto Tech teachers was also going to join them, and um, they had a reschedule of his football game. He's a freshman football coach, so he's out at Keefe Tech, and he didn't make it back in time. So he apologizes, but Sarah and uh, and Jeff are going to uh, tell you about the, the trip we made to Syracuse. So good evening, everybody. Nice to see everyone. Um, they didn't let you drive, did they? <laughs> no. They sent me on my own. <laughs> um, it's an honor, really, to be part of a school community that values improvement. Um, where I came, you know, I, I came from a, a few different experiences, and when Roger came and approached me about Syracuse and this institute, I was very excited and honored to be invited. Uh, it's also exciting to know that uh, the school committee supported such an effort recognizing the importance and the direction that this school needs to go and recognizing the hard work that we put in every day for kids. Um, it was a, a, a refreshing, awesome experience to go to Syracuse with my colleagues. Um, to have a, a superintendent like Roger and a principal like Jill um, behind us, behind this initiative, um, makes it work because the message is clear from the top, from the school committee, to Jill and Roger, to the administrators on my level, to the teachers, that this is important. That student learning is, is the key, is the focus of everything we do, and the cornerstone of um, sort of wh why we show, show up to work every day and do this work. So. What we put together, Sarah uh, is an English teacher, and I'm a special ed director. I put together, we put together a, a, a small presentation for you. Uh, the reason why it excites me, before Sarah um, starts through the process of showing you the PowerPoint, the data backs up everything that these that this institute was discussing with us. So, you know, we all have gone to professional development, and we sit there and we get excited. And then we come back to our schools excited, and then a month goes by, and we fizzle out because either we don't have the resources, we don't have the support. This was a little different. This was a whole group of pe people from all different walks of life in the building coming together and all experiencing something that was backed up by data. These are people that go into the lowest performing schools in the country and yield improvement and the recipe was you know some of the recipe is very elementary it's it's about relationships it's about caring for each other it's a it's about um, learning not teaching it's a it's a it's a, it's a mind shift to follow uh, the professional learning community model and I, I received a tremendous amount of inspiration from this experience and I, I'm so happy to be able to share it with you um, so we'll have Sarah start with the uh, PowerPoint, All right. and we'll show you Thanks. some statistics, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk Go with you about it. it. Hi, again, I'm Sarah Wilkie. I'm an English teacher here. I teach 10th grade. It's my seventh year in the school. And this conference was really eye-opening for me and had a direct impact on my classroom already. So we have some of the key elements. Used one of these before. Is there is there a trick to the clicker? <laughs> the clicker's not working. <laughs> I don't think so. Just oh. Hit the button. 
Yeah. No, not you. Oh. We're going to have to probably move it manually. Yeah. Okay. No. So if we can get these slides to start, this uh, slides will start with with some st statistics that really stand out about our current reality. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So this was some of the startling information that the conference showed all of us. Um, that high school dropouts are 63 times more likely to be incarcerated. Students who fail school are three times more likely to be unemployed. The U.S. dropped from first in the world in percentage of high school graduates to 22nd out of 27 advanced economies. Students who fail school will earn 33 cents for every dollar a graduate from college earns, which is the largest discrepancy of all major economies in the world. So what do we do about it? They taught us some of the essentials of professional learning communities and ways we can work together to address some of these major concerns. So the big ideas of a professional learning community is that we accept learning as the fundamental purpose of our school and therefore are willing to examine all practices in light of their impact on learning. We are committed to working together to achieve our collective purpose. We cultivate a collaborative culture through the development of high performing teams. We assess our effectiveness on the basis of results rather than intentions. Individuals, teams, and schools seek to seek relevant data and information and use that information to promote continuous improvement. There's a large focus on building effective teams in this, uh, in this approach. And it's really a culture shift. So the, one of the key questions is, you know, how are we functioning as a school? Are we a group? Do we have shared goals? but get to them individually? Well, if that's what we are, what happens when one of us is struggling or did not meet the goal? Did the rest of us even notice? And what does that mean for our students? So this image shows a group of people rowing together, which, which symbolizes that if we work as a team, we will work together to achieve shared goals and we will share the responsibilities equally, and we will understand that we can ask for help and rely on each other's strengths to become a better team. So there's a huge difference between running a, running a marathon to win a race and rowing together as a team to win. If you, when you're running a marathon, you're running individually. And when you fail, you fail, you know, when you, don't, when you don't succeed, you sort of fail individually. The idea of being a team is that you share you share uh, responsibility for each other's success. And um, I, I, I do love the image of the team rowing together in unison toward a common goal. And the PLC model is exactly that. So shared responsibility, regardless of their home life, their socioeconomic status, their English proficiency, all students deserve to learn grade level skills essential for success. There are so many factors out of our control, but we need to focus on what we can do. We can commit to sharing the responsibility that comes with ensuring all students are learning. The best chance that we have of all students learning is collaborating with one another, learning from each other's strengths and engaging in continuous reflection. We need to develop and use common formative assessments for the essential skills students need to know and come up with interventions for students not meeting proficiency. The PLC convention suggested formative assessments be completed and reviewed as a team around every three weeks. Regardless of the teacher, 
They have all students should leave each grade level with the skills needed to be successful in the next year. We cannot rely on the assumption that students have learned. We need proof of it. So if you look at that slide, uh, there's a focus on the word all. It's learning for all. Students who are high achieving, students who are average ability, students who are lower functioning, it's a focus on learning for all and how we're going to meet the needs of all learners. Starting point, critical questions that, that people who function in a professional com learning community ask, them, ask the team. What is it we expect students to learn? How will we know when they've learned it? What will we do when they don't learn? And how do we res respond to students when they already know it? Uh, in, my, in my particular area of special education, I know the, one of the large focuses for me is what are we going to do for kids when they don't learn? <clears throat> the, what interventions are we going to bring to their experience to open their minds and provide alternate pathways to learning? Um, it's one, one of the key functions of the special education department at Greater Lowell. And I um, co-teach with a special ed teacher. I'm an inclusion English teacher. So students in my classroom are accessing 10th grade level text and they range from first grade readers to freshmen in college in the same class. So this is incredibly important for me to consider and to work with my co-teacher to address what we're going to do not only with the student who doesn't learn but the one who's excelling right and keeping that balance in the classroom and, and uh, the research was astounding the way to meet the needs of all learners they showed um, statistics of all the different sort of approaches that can be used to help students and when they boiled down all the research the number one factor in school improvement and student achievement is teams that collaborate and share ideas at high levels. They talk to each other, they make time to talk about kids who are successful, kids who are struggling, and they, <coughs> and they build capacity around that shared knowledge. So it's, it's a real um, initiative, not an initiative, a real culture shift where teachers lean on one another and it's, and it's safe to do that. You know, you're not competing with the, the teacher across the hall. You're, co you're sharing information. And when a student's not achieving in, in a classroom, there's a comfort level of going to the teacher across the hall and saying, I see, you know, Johnny is just getting all of these concepts from your experience, but I have Sally in my room and she's just not grabbing it. And that possibility of sharing different strategies is one of the keys to the success of a professional learning community. Uh, so, um, you know, we have as a school have some challenges in terms of co creating co-planning time because we're a vocational school. It's not just Greater Lowell that has that challenge, it's all vocational schools have the, the fundamental challenge of how are we going to create collaborative teams. Um, you know, we, Roger and, and Jill have um, seen the importance of that and you know our co-teachers try to have co-planning time uh, in their experience and um, through our in-service days you know we tr in our department meetings we try to follow a set of norms that <coughs> get us talking about student learning so the focus is not on the agenda and the nuts and bolts and the minutia of how to run a department the shift is to talk about student learning and create um, pockets of time for us to do that. So we're spending our department meetings talking about student learning and looking at student data. So it is a shift and uh, it's going well so far. It's a process, it's slow, we're all learning together, but we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a planning chart that they presented to us and it really kind of um, is related to classroom teachers here but it would be looking at the common core standards and translating them into student friendly terms providing a model of what proficiency looks like considering what are the prerequisite skills the student needs when are we going to teach it how are we going to assess it and then the most important box and 
my opinion, is the extension standards. And that's where teachers consider, well, what do we do after we assess? And I see seven of my students understood it, they're ready to move on. Five were somewhere in the middle, and three had no idea. It's considering that ahead of time and having a plan for intervening um, on behalf of all the levels that we see in our classrooms. Viable curriculum. What is a guaranteed viable curriculum? A guaranteed viable curriculum is one that guarantees equal opportunity for the learning of all students, plain and simple. It guarantees adequate time for teachers to teach content and for students to learn it. A guaranteed and viable curriculum is one that guarantees that the curriculum is being that the curriculum being taught is the curriculum being assessed. It is viable when adequate time is ensured to teach all determined essential content. The Common Core is large with a lot in it and when teams collaborate with one another they determine what are the things that our students absolutely have to know. Those are the things that they focus on and build curriculum around to, to deliver a guaranteed viable curriculum. So whether it's in Sarah's class or their English teacher across the hall for that grade level in that classroom, there are certain aspects of the curriculum that are guaranteed to be covered with kids. That's how I understand a, yeah. a viable curriculum. Uh, it's, it's picking out almost, you know, what are the power standards, what are the most important things kids have to learn in order to move to the next level. And then just some final points, things that we took away. Um, as a classroom teacher, I took away that teaching needs to be way less isolated. The most successful professions rely on collaboration and utilizing the expertise of their employees to make gains. And they did a very nice parallel to the medical profession, where one patient, okay, one patient, doctors, nurses, specialists, all collaborate so that one patient is taken care of. And it's constant communication and reflection. And, um, you know, so many professions that are extremely <coughs> successful have that model. Common formative assessments are essential, so that's dipping in and checking throughout the lesson if students are learning. So again, they used a nice um, little symbol there of a physical from your doctor versus an autopsy. We want to be performing physicals along the way. <laughs> we don't want to wait till the end of the year and, you know, cut open and say, oh, this student failed and they have no idea of the essential skills. We want to be checking along the way. Um, once essential skills are established by the team, all students need to meet proficiency in these skills without exception. So we need to teach and then assess for learning. If all students show proficiency, then we're ready as a class to move on. If some do and some don't, that's when we bring in those extension of learning um, and interventions there to reach proficiency. And then, as teams, we need to establish what proficiency looks like. So we have a shared standard of proficiency and shared models to fairly assess our students across the board and across different teachers. What I like the most about professional learning community model, it's a we mentality that we're collectively joining our talents together and working as a team to make a difference in kids lives bottom line to give kids every opportunity to be successful when they leave here for us to be the best springboard for the students that are entrusted to our care every day so I would say that um, this this model is a culture shift with a focus from uh, with the focus being from teaching to learning and we're at the very beginning, and in my opinion, we're at the very beginning stages of it here, but it's exciting, it's groundbreaking, and I, I think we're headed. You know, I'm proud to be driving in the right direction with a school that supports this model. So thank you for the time. And, and I just, in final little thoughts, I found the PLC convention to be extremely valuable, not only for my professional development, but 
to incorporate these same ideas into my classroom, right? So my students and I, we're all on the rowboat together. And if someone's floundering, then not only will I intervene, but other students can become mentors for their classmates. And it really does um, make a huge difference when we become a collaborative team within my class, then within the department, within the administration, and then, you know, all the way up. It, it makes a huge difference and absolutely is the best chance we have to get all students to learn what they need to know and be ready to go for successful careers in college in the future. Great. Um, Mr. Moran, you have yeah. a question? Uh, so was this a first run of this professional learning community for you? It was. Okay. Yes, it was my first experience. Yes, I, was, I came from a school who did PLCs, so they, you know, a bunch of teachers went out and had professional development and read a few books about it and then said, oh, we're a PLC now. So that was my first experience. But I, I've learned through this, going to this, that that's not, that's not what a PLC is. A PLC is a, is a shift in your thinking about kids and learning. So that will affect our learning styles, yeah? Absolutely. And maybe you don't have this answer, but would this in any way possibly come up in an early release day? Uh, yeah, or um, do you have something already scheduled for the year? So the so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this with the presentation that I did for faculty. Okay. I'm going to do that next. So so you're going to get a, a little bit more insight into the into where we're going with the PLC okay. concept. Right. Okay. I think a real important point that, that that Jeff and Sarah made was that uh, the professional learning community model isn't something you do. It's a culture. It's a culture focused on on every doing everything we possibly can for kids to learn. Uh, that's our number one focus. We're doing it in a collaborative way because we're interdependent with one another on our success, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable, accountable to measure some results at the end. It's not just going to be good intentions. We think this is nice. We're going to, at the end of the day, be able to show you some some results. This is what we were able. This is the improvement. So, it's a it's a it, in a way it's it's sort of like I think an easy way to explain it is. Toyota became very successful with a total quality man TQM, right? Total quality management was the model that to Toyota used to become a very successful company. This is total quality management for schools. They just call it professional learning communities. It's about improvement. It's about continuous improvement. It's about working together, doing everything we can so that we can be as successful as, as possible for our students. Um, we had 28 people go. I was the only one, I believe, that went that had ever gone to one before. I had been to two previously. Um, I also had the good fortune to be at a school that over a six year period implemented um, this model and, and the, success, the successes that we been achieved. Held, yeah. Pardon me? No, it's, it's all over the country. It's all over the country. We went to the one, we picked the one that was closest to here, which was Syracuse, that we could get to by vehicle and not have to get, you know, not, not run up the cost with, because we wanted to take as many people as we could. So we're trying to keep the cost down. So we didn't get on an airplane and go to San Diego or, or you know, wherever else. It, but the, the, these are, are being held all over the country uh, on a regular basis. I was fortunate. I went twice. They were both happened to be in Boston back-to-back -back years. I just had to go to Boston. Hasn't been back to Boston since. So um, we were very fortunate that it was close enough in Syracuse to go. Uh, we were also very fortunate and very grateful that, that you approved it for us to go. I had been twice before. I knew that if we could get, then what I was worried about was whether or not anybody would want to go. I knew it was, it was really uh, quality professional development. I knew our people would get a lot out of it and it would be the beginning of a journey. This is going to be a continuous process. It's, this never ends. You just keep getting, you know, higher, 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 better, better, better. So it's an ongoing process, just like, you know, just like TQM. Uh, what I was worried about was that, you know, we might have only gotten six or seven teachers that were willing to give up time in their summer to go. I was shocked that we got 28 teachers that were willing to go. I, was ha I would have been happy with six or seven. You've got to start somewhere. So right? that this qualified for professional development for them? Absolutely, yeah. They'll get their uh, 15, I think, 15 and a half yep. PDPs for yes. their time up there. And yes. we're going to be working. Uh, the, the idea right now to implement is, um, and this, you know, this will be part of my presentation, so I won't have to, I'll be able to go quicker. Um, so we have 28 people who are di diverse from, from diverse areas of the school. So Jeff's an administrator of special education. Sarah's a, a, a teacher. Jeff's been a teacher for you know, X amount of years. Sarah's only been a teacher for a shorter time. We had brand new people that we just hired go, right? We had uh, 
we had every department in the school represented. So this was done in a thoughtful way. Jill and I sat down because we want somebody that went to Syracuse at every departmental meeting because we want the departmental meetings to start to develop this culture, right? Now, in addition to that, we also had a retreat with our 17 administrators where we have a consultant from Research for Better Teaching that facilitates that. And that retreat was all about the same thing that the conference was about. So now at the departmental meetings, you have the department, the department chair, the cluster chair or the director leading the meetings. And you have some teacher leaders who went to Syracuse all understanding where we're trying to go so that, so that we start to build that. It's a culture. It's not something you do. It's not an initiative. It's a culture shift. Um, and it's about having a, what's called a professional learning culture, where we interact as professionals, we interact at a very high level, uh, and it's all about high performance and high achievement, and it's about all learning for all students, and that every student matters, and that the future of every student is in our hands. And, and them, the, the student and the family and the parents have entrusted us with the future success of those children. And we've got to do everything possible to make sure that by the time they graduate from this high school, they're ready to be successful, whether it's college, whether it's work, um, and also, also um, be able to function as a productive and a good citizen. So um, this is really exciting stuff. I couldn't have been, I, I mean, I almost fell off my chair when we got 28 people ago. Uh, I, I'm very grateful, I'm very, very grateful to the two of you to, for, for being here tonight and sharing. I'm uh, very grateful for you um, for taking the time to go with us. Uh, Tracy, who's our new guidance director, also went to uh, PLC conference with us. She was one of the 28. So, uh, so thank you both very, very, very much. Thank, thank, you, for thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sarah. Thanks. Uh, if I could just make a comment about that. Sure. Um, we, we as a school committee approve uh, many different ways to spend funds. And our goal here, as your goal is, as, as administrators or teachers' goals are, are about teaching students. And today we got, tonight we got a report from um, you and um, Sarah as well as Jeff. Jeff and uh, they let us know how much how excited they are about education and how excited they are to work together and how excited that they are to really try to develop our student body and our teaching staff. We also got a very nice report from Ms. Messina about the uh, practical nursing program that, that, that stated, you know, we're one of the best nursing programs um, that, that come out of, you know, the, the country. Um, just, because, just because we're from Massachusetts. And it's things that we approve, and it's also things that we really like to hear because it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we don't know a lot about unless we hear these, you know, wonderful types of um, summaries of what you have here. So, you know, thank you very much, and um, let's move on. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, for the, the words yeah. of encouragement. and. Um, we, we can only be as successful as the support that you give us and, and the trust you put in us that, 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 we're, that we're always going to do the best we can do for our kids. Uh, that's why we get into the profession, and that's why we, we, we show up for work every day. So, so thank you for that. Um, as you can see, whoops, what happened to our... We went into sleep mode. Um, we went into the, sleep mode on Mr. O'Hare? Yeah, just a, a, just a couple of comments on the presentation. Hmm. And I think the director and the teacher is in one of the toughest roles of an educator. I think that's the most uh, difficult uh, uh, way to, to uh, whatever the method is, it's, uh, it's one of the most difficult jobs as a teacher would have or an administrator in special ed. I, you know, there's a lot of questions I keep having and I don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Because if we remember, you know, a great person in Lowell, General Benjamin Butler, who was a general during the Civil War, said all men are not created equal, which was kind of an unusual statement to make uh, from someone in that position. And think of it, all children in that their department are not created equal. So how, uh, and I keep asking the question, how do you get them on the same team and doing the same, or have the same capabilities as any other students? Uh, I, uh, how are you going to compare them or, or mark them or grade them with student A versus student Z? It becomes a very, very difficult uh, question. What do you do halfway through the season when you're trying to build them up 
have some of the teammates help them to develop in the same area and they're still not developing. There are many areas, and I don't, I don't want to get into it too much with our school, that outsource kids so that they get more individual training. I don't think we do a lot of that at this particular school. Uh, it's very expensive. Can we do it with our own staff? Uh, that's, again, I'm, I'm just saying that the, the staff that we have, the staff in that discipline is so, it's, it's they're, they're about the most dedicated educators that I know, directors, staff, etc. But I don't see, I don't think we'll, and I don't, I don't want to really get into too deep, but I don't think we'll ever get 100% or 90% success rate on what we're trying on what some of the positions were that were mentioned that we'll ever get uh, our students at that level <clears throat> to a very very high percentage um so many schools outsource it costs a lot of money we can't afford i, well, I don't want to say we can't afford it but we don't try to afford it because it's astronomical but i don't i i don't want to say is this pie in the sky that we would like to accomplish this so, so what, we tr what we're trying to do, learning about professional learning communities and, and growing as a professional learning culture, is to establish the, the guaranteed viable curriculum that, that Sarah and Jeff talked about. So the guaranteed viable curriculum are the essential skills on grade level that every kid has to know to be able to go to the next grade level so that yeah. nobody moves on without those skills. Now, other kids that are further along or that, 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 that learn quicker are going to learn more than that. But everybody in that class, before they go on to the next course or the next class or the next grade level, is going to get that, that's gonna be the minimum. So we're not gonna to continue to teach kids who, I mean, kids may come in here with fourth grade reading level, right? So we've gotta get them up to 12th grade reading level before they graduate, right? So we're not gonna be able to get them to ninth grade reading level in one year, but we'll be able to get them to 12th grade le reading level by the time they graduate. That's what they need to be able to be successful whether they go into a vocational career or whether they go to college. The research shows that the same level of, of academic skills that you need to be successful in college are the same skills you need to be successful in a, in a vocational career. They did a study and we learned about it at this, at this institute. Um, they looked at the ele electrical uh, trade and they looked at the auto tech trade. And if you don't have the same level of skills that you need to enter college without yeah. remedial courses, you're not going to be, you, you'll be able to, to change oil, but you're not going to be successful as an auto technician because you have to have those academic skills. Yeah. So we're working as, you know, and, and it's a culture shift. It's, it's not about teachers. You look at the traditional teaching model, you know, what, what, what does that look like? That looks like teachers, academic teachers in separate rooms with their doors shut who hardly ever talk to each other, right? This is about collaborative interdependent teams trying to figure out, hey, what works well for you? What works well for you? Who's doing this? You know, I'm having trouble teaching this concept. Do you have any ideas, right? So it's, it's, about, it's about collaborating uh, and working together as a team and focusing to make sure every student has that minimum level of skills before, before they move on. And uh, are other kids gonna learn a lot more than that? What Absolutely. Are you, what are the, your goals? Uh, what is a reasonable goal of where you want those students to be in, in percentages. You know, some kids just, uh, we've all seen them, but again, special ed is very difficult, and I'm thinking of the special ed teachers that made the presentation. It's very difficult, very difficult to get them uh, to raise the bar. So and I don't know how, you know, it's- we're, we're just starting this journey. Yeah. This is, this is where we're headed. This was our, this, you know, we had a focus group. <clears throat> now we went to a conference. We're starting this journey, but, um, you know, our, our goal is uh, to continue to de develop the concept, to continue develop, uh, developing that culture that every student is going to leave here on grade level, unless they have an IEP that, that states that they, that they can't do that because of the, a significant learning disability, right? But unless the IEP says they can't do it, then, you know, we're going to make sure that, that, that or we're going to work to make sure that every student graduates right. on grade level ready to go to work or ready to go to college. I guess I'm looking at those people at IEPs. Right? You know, I mean, there, there, there are probably, you know, and they talked about this at the conference, that unless the IEP states that the, the, their cognitive ability is so disabled that they can't, then they're on a, then they're on a different grading system. So they're, they're never going to, you know, they're not going to be able to reach grade level uh, to, go, to go and do college work. But for the kids that just need more time, right, and we're going to be looking at innovative ways. How do we provide more time? Because what we're really talking about, time's the variable, right? Some kids need more time than what we have in a school day. 
they need extra help after school, they might yeah. need a summer program, they can get there, they just need more support and time. And part of it is, you know, kid comes, if, if children come to us, you know, two, three, four years behind grade level, you know, that's not our fault. But our job is to get them caught up by the time they, they're, they're in the 12th grade. What's it going to take? It's going to take more time for those kids. So we're going to have to figure out ways to be able to put more time into, into, into their schedule. You're probably, you're probably not going to take the kid as, that's way below grade level in the school. You know, if, if a student has, you know, the learning disabilities of, of you know, to that magnitude, they, you know, the, there, there may be better placements that would serve their needs better than... Well, than we that's, that's... That's a, that's a different issue. That's you another know, issue, That's yes. something that the, the parents and the children have to decide. That's another issue, know, and it's a big why. financial issue also. What's the, what, where they should go, yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to okay. the uh, All right. subject. So, Thank you. So the, um, as you can see, there's a rowing theme here. Um, and this actually, we had this uh, as you walked into the faculty entrance. This was on that new screen that, that's in the hallway. Um, but when we did our, our administrators retreat, uh, retreat um, the common reading that we did as administrators was the, the Lencioni book on the five dysfunctions of a team. Um, and in it, uh, one of his quotes is that if you can get it, all the people in an organization rowing the same direction, you can dominate any industry any mark, in any market against any competition at any time and, and that really sums up what this is all about what this whole culture shift is all about we're all rowing in the same direction to do the best we can for kids and I missed a question hmm. and I know this was this all educators yes I mean because you know this this also sounds like Len, Lencioni's all, work is about I mean, businesses say, and it educators. sounds an right. industry you know that, that yeah. we all need to be rowing in the same direction as well yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean so yeah, the Lencioni, Lencioni is a, a Harvard professor that teaches business classes. But the, <coughs> what he teaches to businesses, just like TQM with Toyota, is applicable to, to school systems. Uh, same thing. So uh, this is the presentation we did to faculty to welcome them back. Um, we, we welcomed the new employees. Uh, we, we talked about some of our accomplishments and things we wanted to celebrate. We talked about position changes and logistics and and the whole concept of success for all students, and we also talked about where we are in our PLC journey. So this presentation, I wanted to share with you how we welcome back our staff to give you a feel for that and, and where we are. Um, you just met previously at the meet and greet, most of the new community members that uh, we welcomed. Uh, when the faculty came back, Jill, Jill took a few minutes to um, talk a little bit about each one of them so that the staff could start to get a feel for uh, the different people that were in the room that were new to our community and um, what their backgrounds were. We had a few position changes. Mike Barton is now the Director of Curriculum Instruction Assessment. Michelle Bergeron was in the, in the uh, Curriculum Office. She's now the Co-op Secretary. Eric uh, Burgess um, shifted from history. Uh, he transferred to an opening in Special Ed. Chad Fallon now is Director of Technology instead of Assessment. Mike's doing Assessment. Um, and Josh Hughes, our new Network Manager. So we went over those position changes. Because of the construction project, we had a whole bunch of relocations uh, to make the building more efficient and effective. Um, so the guidance suite is all consolidated. All the guidance counselors are now in the suite. So we had three that used to have offices outside the suite. They are now part of the guidance team within the suite. Uh, we now have a co-op office, the former technical studies office, uh, and we have a three-person team in that office. We've got uh, Michelle, Stacy, and Lisa. So we're really consolidating and, and putting some support behind um, students to be able to go on co-op. Um, our data team, uh, Steve and Mike, are now in Charlene and Trisha's old offices. Um, our family liaison is in Mike McGovern's old office. She's now reporting to uh, Liz Bennett. She does a lot of the interpreting uh, for us. Um, Christine Messina's office now is no longer on the third floor. It's down by the old, um, as you enter, down, yeah, across from the old um, security booth, right? Uh, teacher testing moved into Christine's former offices, thus freeing up a very large room that could be turned into a classroom uh, so we don't have teachers floating. Each teacher has their own classroom. Um, we've renamed the, the, the discipline office. We no longer have a discipline office. It's now the main office. Uh, so we re renamed that for strategic reasons. We want people to, we don't want it to have a negative connotation when someone goes into the office, that it, it's the main office of the school. Uh, also adjacent to that, we have three brand new conference rooms, plus the, the room that already existed there, so that when folks come in from the outside, uh, they don't have to go up to the third floor for a meeting, that they're able to just go right across the mall and they can meet right there. Uh, breakfast now is only offered in the new cafeteria. It's going very well. 
a cafeteria is 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 a, a real um, center point in the morning of kids coming in. Nice natural lighting, uh, beautiful atmosphere. Um, so we're no longer offering breakfast in the mall area. It's it's consolidated just to the cafeteria, and we're hoping to be able to do some work in the Aramark area, uh, and, and possibly at some point in time be able to to create a cyber cafe, commercial laundry. Uh, institutional food service where we can kind of extend our hospitality uh, hotel management program uh, into that area and we celebrated uh, a lot of really good things that that, that happened last okay. year um, if you look at the class of 2015 31 percent of them graduated working on co-op that's up two percent um, 40 Three percent of the class, as opposed to 36 percent of the class, participated on co-op during the year. So our participation rate overall went up. It was just 31 percent actually finished. If you look at our class of 2016, which would have been our juniors last year, um, going into the summer, we last year we uh, two years ago we only had nine percent out on co-op. This year we had 19 percent out on co-op. So we're seeing some real good trends. Um, 155 skill USA district participants that's 47 more kids than the year before we won two more gold medals eight more silver medals and five more bronze medals so those are some really nice uh, success indicators that our kids are are participating they're more involved and they're they're successful uh, absolutely uh, unbelievable statistic um, and, I, and I know that that, that 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 you haven't taken classes on how to interpret MCAS data but but when I tell you that when student growth percentile, SGP, student growth percentile is the most important, most valuable and viable statistic with regards to MCAS. The reason is because all of the MCAS data compares the 10th grade class this year to the 10th grade class last year. So you're, you're comparing apples to oranges, right? Because it's a different class, right? SGP can, can, uh, compares the cohort of kids in the eighth grade that had the same score, right? The exact same score. So everybody in the Commonwealth that had that score that that child has, and then they went to school, ninth and 10th grade at Greater Lowell, and then SGP tells you, did they do better than they did with, with, with compared to how the other kids grew in the 10th grade, or did they, they do worse? So if you are at a 50 percentile ranking, then the kids' scores in the cohort were about the same in the 10th grade as they were in the eighth grade. So you offered the same type of education quality-wise that they got prior to coming here. If you're above 50%, then they're gaining at a faster level than they did before. They compared to all the other kids that are going to other high schools, right? So 64th percentile, we're in, that's high, I mean, we went up 11 points in math, all right? Uh, Carol Chisholm, I think I was explaining to somebody downstairs, I mean, that is, I mean, that's rock star stuff, right? I mean, those ninth and 10th grade teachers did something incredibly well um, to go up 11 points uh, into the 64th percentile in math. It is just outstanding. 36% um, advanced, that's up 4%, 17% over, th over three years. So some really good stuff going on. 55.5 uh, percentile in ELA, ELA went up 7.5 points. That's really good too, right? That is, uh, that is outstanding. So there's some, you know, and under Jill's leadership, uh, there are some outstanding things happening uh, on the instruction end uh, in our school. 25% ELA uh, MCAST advanced, that's up 18%. Uh, so 17% advanced up in math over a three year period, 25% in ELA. Um, interscholastic athletic participation, you know, I mean, schools aren't just about MCAST tests, it's about kids coming and wanting to be here, staying and participating in extracurriculars. Um, those are all success indicators and, and indicators to me, whether or not, I mean, I told the freshmen when I welcomed the freshmen, all right, I, I was, I'm, you know, one of the nice things about being superintendent, I'm the first person to talk to the freshmen when they come in, right? So freshmen come in, the, the, the whole place is full, the, the lecture hall, 564 freshmen, right? The only thing I wanted to tell them is that I'm the superintendent, I want you to know what my job is. My job is to make sure you love coming to school every day. That's my job. If you don't like coming to school, you need to come and tell me. I told them exactly where my office is. I want you to love coming to school. Let me know what I can do. Well, when, when we go up 195 kids uh, more participating in sports than two years ago, 
then there's a lot of kids that love coming to school a lot more. And that's what these indicators. It's not just about test scores and it's not just about academics or Skills USA. It's about about kids love coming to school um, and, and, and kids being successful. We want them to be welcomed. We want them to feel welcomed when they come through the door. We want them to feel accepted for whoever they are and from whatever circumstances they're coming from. And we want them to feel that they're going to get the support they need to be successful. That that's what we're here for. And that's what the PLC movement's all about. It's about finding the support. <laughs> finding the support, yeah, and great coaches as well. Um, winter, we went up 220 students uh, participating over two years, and spring sports went up 297. So um, students caught doing good, which is a really neat thing that, that we do. Teachers see students doing really nice things for other students, and they, they, um, they let Jamie Costa know what they saw. We give them an award for that. We caught you doing something really good. Um, that went up 74 more kids did something caught doing good this year than uh, the previous year. Community service learning, you heard a little bit from our student rep about some of the things we're doing. 26 more students participated in that. So, uh, three, and clubs and activities uh, went up 22 students. So everything's trending in a, in a really you know, forward and, and positive manner. We had our first annual co-op employer appreciation dinner this year. That was something new that we kicked off. Uh, great event, some of you were able to be there. Um, we also gave out our first business partner of the year award. Uh, to the Lowell Five. Uh, we also have a very exciting business partnership. We're going to be having a ribbon cutting. Uh, we're looking at October 29th for the ribbon cutting uh, to have here. It would be a, a 2.30 uh, meet and greet followed by a 3 o'clock uh, and you'll, we'll get you some information on that. Uh, we just finalized the date actually this morning. Um, a lot of corporate folks from CVS along with Jonathan are uh, going to be here. Um, but our health and medical uh, assisting pharmacy tech program and our marketing we're going to be putting in that new school store down in the mall um, we're hoping to, to ribbon cut on both of those um, coming up most important thing in addition to the donations that they've made with regards to improving our facilities to be able to teach kids uh, providing us with curriculum and training uh, they've also connected with about a dozen CVS stores and they're waiting for our kids to start to be able to start hiring them on co-op can uh, so. we be notified when uh, that happens so that we could come? No, absolutely. You're, you're going to get a formal invitation. Um, okay. CVS is going to put together formal invitations. Uh, you're on the list. I'm going to give you a, a save the date, uh, October 29th. I'll, we'll send something out. Okay. Save the date, October 29th, 2.30 to 4.30 um, here as well. So our, our mission, success for all students, um, promising. Uh, this is our promise that... that Every student that comes here will be re uh, ready for career, uh, college, and citizenship in the 21st century. So this is all about delivering on that promise. Um, the day before our students came, our teachers came back, our faculty came back, and I added this slide at the last minute, um, the commissioner of education, Mitchell, Mitchell Chester, um, sent out his kind of, you know, weekly welcome, you know, it was a weekly, his weekly um, newsletter but it was the welcome back to school newsletter, right? And there were three quotes in it that really caught my eye. Uh, one of the things he said was, a core strength of our system is the dedication of our educators to continuous improvement. You just heard a whole bunch of, about that, right? So that was, you know, that was one of his, uh, and I put in parentheses, that that's what a professional learning community is. That's absolutely what it is. Um, he also stated, we increasingly are turning our attention to the social, emotional well-being of our youth while advancing the education they will need to succeed after high school. So it's not just about test scores or MCAS, right? Kids are coming from a lot of different places with a lot of different issues and a lot of different things they need support and help with. And the social emotional well-being, I would argue, is more important than the test scores. If you take care of the social emotional well-being of the child, the test scores will go up. They will go up. Um, and the last quote was, as strong as our educational program is, there are still too many students who meet our graduation requirements and then find out that they're not ready for credit-bearing college work or the expectations of employers. So they leave a school, they go on to college, and they find out they have to take X number of remedial courses. They're not ready. Our promise and what the professional learning community models about is every student graduating on grade level so that they don't need remedial work. Are we there yet? No. We have a long way to go, absolutely. Have we begun the work? Yes. Career and college readiness indicators. Um, Occupational knowledge and skills, we're focused on our cooperative education program. We're focused on getting more kids out and transitioned. We're focusing on uh, Skills USA results. 
We're focusing on students attaining industry recognized credentials. Um, example of that, cosmetology students graduating with a cosmetology state license. Um, auto tech students graduating haven't passed some of the ASC um, credentials. So credentials of value. Academic, we want uh, students to graduate on grade level. That's our minimum standard. Are students going to graduate above grade level? Some are, absolutely. And we're going we're to push them as hard as we can. Um, but we're going to get every student to grade level uh, that we possibly can get. We look at MCAS scores and data. We also look at Accuplacer scores and data. Accuplacer is the community college and state college uh, college entrance exam to determine whether or not you have to take uh, remedial courses. We are now testing every one of our kids when they leave here. We don't just um, let the community college test them and then we only get data on the ones that, that went to community college. We're, we're testing all the kids. We want to know where we are um, and that's going to be the data that we use to determine whether you know how many of our kids are getting to grade level and we're going to get that percentage up every year. Um, but the third thing is, is that they, ha they leave here with the positive behaviors necessary for success. The social, emotional, health and well-being, employability skills, uh, attendance, discipline rates. That if students have bad behaviors when they come in as a ninth grader, then we have four years to change them into good behaviors. If they leave here with bad behaviors, they're not going to be any more successful in college or in career than, than they were here. They're going to continue to struggle. So it's really a focus on, on changing behavior. Not discipline for the sake of punishing kids, because discipline or consequences, negative consequences, uh, to, to a, a cohort of kids are meaningless, right? You can send them to detention as much as you want. If the behavior doesn't change, then it's not, it's not doing any good. For a lot of kids, and for the majority of kids, the fact that there's going to be a consequence for the behavior is enough. But there's other kids that, that we need to figure out other ways to help them change their behavior than just punishing them. And we're working on that. We've we, actually got we, a behavior. We went through that a few years ago. And I forget what, I don't think the <coughs> results were too impressive I yeah forget, so I forget what the results were yeah. you know so we're, we're, we're focusing on taking a look at that we've actually got a Jamie's actually got a group of people that are, are looking at you know there's a whole um, non coercive discipline model out there it's not about the I mean there's going to be co negative consequences for negative behavior absolutely but if it doesn't change the behavior then th we're missing the piece we need to add the piece that's going to change the behavior so that the student realizes what it is and why you know, what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it and, and that it needs to change if they're going to be successful, that it's always going to get in their way. So another thing that, um, that came out um, as part of the, the PLC conference, but also another um, conference that I attended uh, this summer was, you know, p people a lot of times, and, and teachers especially, and, and, and I blame it on the Department of Education, that they use data as a hammer, right? So your school's not doing well, we're gonna put negative stuff in the paper about you, you're gonna be identified, and, and you know, we're gonna try, you know, I'm gonna sort of like embarrass school systems to do better. Data, and, and somebody used this uh, from Teachers 21, he said, you need to use data as a flashlight. Don't be afraid of data. It's a flashlight, it tells you what you need to do to get better. So use it as a flashlight. It's not about blaming anybody. It's not about you're not doing a good job. Look at the data. It's about, hey, that's the flashlight. This is where we're at now. So whatever our you know, remediation rate is for Accuplacer, then that's what it is now. Let's just make it better. It's no one's fault. It's where we are. If we're going to do a good job for our kids, then we're going to use data as a flashlight, uh, and we're going to figure out how to do a better job for moving forward. Um, over the summer, I visited four employers, okay? I went out and I visited four employers. I picked four employers, one from each cluster, right, that, has been, that have been employing our students for a while, okay, um, and are employing more than one student. So they're pretty invested in our program and invested in our kids. Uh, what I wanted to find out from the employers was, well, I wanted to thank them for, for, for being business partners, and I also wanted to find out what are we doing well, what do you, what do you see that, 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 that are strengths of our kids, and where do we need to, um, do a better job. You know, what is it that, that, that our kids are struggling with that we can maybe do a better job so that, so that they're better prepared? Um, and, they, and what they told us is that, or what they told me, was that they need our kids, they need good employees to maintain and grow their company. They can't grow their company, they can't maintain their workforce unless they've got good employees. Um, they also told me that they understand students are young and still maturing, so they don't expect them to be perfect. They don't, ex you know, they know that they're growing, they know that they have to help them along in that process. Um, they also appreciate the level of technical skills, so they're coming out of Greater Lowell Tech with some technical skills from, from their vocational programs, and they appreciate that um, and they recognize that. 
They also, for the most part, say that our kids, when they get on the job with them, they're courteous and they're friendly uh, most of the time, most of the kids. So th those are strengths. Um, what they, whoops. Okay. So what they what they told me um, that we could help with or or try to assist with it. the major issues attendance students take too many days off they don't give proper notice uh, they feel that, that that a lot of them are not reliable they, and they end up understaffed because they didn't you know sometimes the kids know we can advance that they need a day off but they don't call in or they don't tell them until the last minute so um, we need to work on the kids understanding that you know. Um, when you get a job, there's no more excused absences, right? People want you there every day. Uh, and, and, that, and we've got to work with kids around that. Um, they also, some of them have, have difficulty staying focused and on task. They need to work with a purpose. They need to use their time more efficiently and effectively. They're being paid um, to get work done and, and to think on their feet. Um, and the last one was that, that um, Kids don't understand the, the use of jargon, so that they talk and, and they talk to adults and they talk to customers like they talk to their buddies, yeah. okay? And they need to learn that you need to have, you, you know, you need to communicate with adults a certain way and customers a certain way. You can communicate <coughs> with your buddies a certain way. So it was really good feedback. It, it was actually, after I presented this to staff, they, uh, I got emails asking for this slide, if I could share it with them, because they wanted to share it with their kids. And then actually somebody made a, a suggestion that, graphic design create a poster with this information so that they could put it up academic teachers vocational teachers could put it up in their shop and say hey you know this is what the employers told us this isn't us talking anymore this is what they're ta they're telling us this is what we need to, to to be paying attention to so you've gotten a lot of information about PLCs um, this is uh, very briefly what I shared with staff because uh, you got to understand even though um, even though 28 of us went there was still you know we've, we've got 207 teachers right so only 28 uh, teachers administrators went to this so there's a lot of other folks that are just learning about it from the people that went so we shared a little bit about um, you know the definition of a PLC collaborative and recurring cycles of collective inquiry action research to get better results for students um, PLC operates under the assumption that the key to improve learning for students is the continuous job embedded learning of the teachers, right, of the educators. So as teachers are, are, are learning together better ways to serve kids, then, then, then that's how we raise test scores. Um, the three big ideas of the PLC, the first big idea is that we're focused on learning for all students. Um, in a traditional education model in the past, the focus has been on teaching. So, hey, I'm a teacher, I got up, I taught, it's the student's job to learn, it's my job to teach. I did my job, I taught. If they didn't learn, that's their fault, right? That's not, that's not the model. The model is my job as a teacher is to make sure that every kid learned. It's not just enough to teach, it's a, I have to make sure because the way I teach may not be in the learning style that, I, that some of my students learn. So I now have to look and, and find, okay, who learned? And that was the, the formative assessment that uh, Sarah talked about. Who learned? Who's still struggling? All right, what do I need to do for the people that are, the students that are struggling? Um, the second big concept is, so it's a shift from teaching to learning. Um, the second big concept is collaborative and in, a collaborative and inter, interdependent culture that we're, we're working together, it's based on mutual respect, it's based on the, the mutual commitments that we make to each other um, and trust. And the last one is the accountability for results. Good intentions are not enough. We have to be able to measure achievement, measure results at the end that we're actually making the difference that we're trying to make. Uh, where are we on the journey? Um, before I even got here, um, the Department of Education held a PLC workshop. It wasn't the exact same model that we're looking at that we went to Syracuse to learn about, but it's got some of the, the components in it. Um, and we had a group of people that participated during that year uh, in those workshops. So that was the first kind of uh, foray into uh, PLCs. Um, last August, um, two Augusts ago, uh, at our administrative retreat, um, we introduced the concept. We had the facilitator introduce the concept of what PLCs are, okay? This year, we went much deeper into that. Um, we also had an ed reform focus group that had nine meetings. We had 11 individuals that learned about it um, and basically, you know, made sure that this was something we wanted to move forward on. 
Um, so we did that in the course of last year. Uh, then we went to Syracuse with 28 people. Then we went really deep into it for two and a half days at our administrative retreat. Um, and now we're, we're getting into this school year and now our departments are going to start to embed with the people that, have, that, that, that are uh, being trained and that have experienced this uh, into the culture. It's a culture. It's how we operate. It's how we operate. This is transformational work. Um, this is not easy. Uh, change is hard. Real change is real hard. And cultural change is extremely hard. So we're not saying it's easy. We're saying that it's hard and we're going to support people. And, and, and no matter how hard it is, it's the right thing to do for our students. So we're going to do it. Uh, keep it simple. Focus on what you can do today. You heard Sarah say that. Maintain a positive attitude. Always assume good intentions. Have a growth mindset. Be willing to search out better practices. It's not that we're not, you know, if I'm teaching a concept, I'm teaching it the best way I know how. But I need to have my, an open mind that there might be a better way. And I have to be willing to search that out and see if I can find a better way. And if I have a really great way of teaching it, there might be somebody else that I can share it with. Uh, and then they can do a better job. Um, focus on learning for all students. Um, every student's got to get to that, um, to be on grade level by 12th grade. Work together, collaborative interdependency, uh, based on mutual respect and trust. And we're still rowing, and we're having a great year so far. So, so thank you um, for the time. I did. I think, uh, can I just comment? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, when uh, we go to a conference or a seminar or a lecture or whatever, I think not only, you know, these practices of what we learned, I also like to listen to the other educators that are there from different school districts, or diff in this case, different parts of the country, mm. uh, to compare oranges and apples to say, you know, like they say, where we are here in Massachusetts or where we are here at Greater Law, as opposed to, you know, like I said, with, we repeat sometimes go to conferences and, you know, it, it's nice to see other educators, administrators, uh, not just school board members, to say that, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, it, it's, it's nice to know, you know, or get some feedback from them, uh, maybe what they're doing, we're not doing, uh, where we're at. So One of the really, really... That's a big educational thing yeah. for me. Yeah. It's not so much that you know, I want to go to this lecture, or I mean, on like this itinerary here, I don't know if everybody went to every single session. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, I know that some of it was for, uh, uh, you know, lower grades also. Mm -hmm. You know, but like I said, I think I like to be able to communicate with other educators, other school board members, other administrators. Uh, and, you know, in some cases it's it's school attorneys and stuff like that. And, and to see, to compare how they're doing mm -hmm. as well. And one of the really nice things about um, going away to this conference with 28 people was that the 28 of us got to know each other a lot better. We got to, to, to interact. We got to have dinner together. We got to, to ride on the bus together. So we really got to know our colleagues that we don't see that often, myself included, um, much better. So uh, along that same thought, thought um, is it not just interact with people from other parts of the country and other school districts, um, even just to go away with 28 people that, that, that most of whom you don't see on a regular basis and get a chance to spend two and a half days and get to know them a little better. Could, was, uh, could I have that list? That's great. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Would there be any benefit to having, like, the workshop right here to the school so that 217 people can receive that benefit? Yeah. I, I think it's a time constraint because a lot of people don't want to volunteer two and a half days. I don't know how this, it would fit in the school day or in the school year or anything like that, but it would be maybe something of interest to bring a workshop like so that it, here. So the, the, the quality of the workshop and the presenters, I mean, there, there's like 2,000 people in the room for this thing, right? Um, it would be cost prohibitive to bring it here for, for 200 people. Um, I've been hoping they'd come back to Boston so that it's a little closer. But what they do offer and that we're looking into is you can pay them to send a facilitator here. And they actually will live stream all of the presentations from the conference to the school. And then there's a facilitator from Solution Tree who facilitates it here. So you can actually open it up to... Um, 
the staff here so that they could come here and, and remotely, it's not the exact same thing, but it's like 90% of it. Um, so we're looking, we're looking into possibly maybe doing that next summer. If there's enough interest for yeah, people to come. One of the processes for you to do maybe or for the administration is to embed it and then get it out to the department heads. So did they actually give you like a shell or a, an outline that you can help facilitate to the department heads themselves and then assimilate it that way? Outward, or yeah, it, it hasn't been broken down like that yet. It, well, one of one of the one of the themes is that this is something you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So once people start to understand the culture that we're trying to build, then you just start doing it. And there's actually a book, and everybody that went to the conference got the book. It's learning by doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there is a checklist in there that that it, as you progress and start functioning as a professional learning culture, um, these are the things that will be happening at your meetings. So, so th there is a guide uh, line for that. Mr. Espinola. I think there is a portion of that um, team building mm -hmm. um, that is facilitated by um, being outside of their own environment. Um, when mm -hmm. they go to an outside environment and they are there by themselves in a different environment, um, it, it, like it, they, it, it attracts them to each other mm. instead of the external forces of their environment. Um, so I think that um, having having this taught here, mm. um, although it may be fantastic um, and and quite um, uh, quick uh, to get it done, I think that there's a portion of the concept that's going to be taken mm. away from. Um, the design of the course. Yeah, it's That's not the I, no, opinion. it's not the ideal I've been to situation. Many of these courses yeah. and uh, it's all about team building yeah. too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we're going to be putting our plan together, but our, our plan does include, and I said it to the staff that hopefully everybody at some point in time will get to go to the PLC at Work Institute. Mm -hmm. These people were picked strategically for you know. The first group we picked were the people that did the DSE thing that was offered because they had an interest. The second group were the 11 that did the focus group. And then after that, we looked at the people, and almost all of those people wanted to go. Then we looked at, okay, now we still have X amount of openings. Which departments aren't represented? And then we started recruiting from the departments that weren't represented. So this group was put together in a strategic way. But the next group will be, you know, anybody who hasn't gone yet who would like to go, you know, who's interested. We'll still try to keep the diversity of different um, we don't want all veteran teachers or all new teachers. We want to get a mix of veteran teachers, mid-career teachers, and new teachers. Uh, and we want to get a mix to get as many, if not all, uh, departments represented. Um, but that's, when you we'll, get we'll still the, be looking to do that. When you get to the place that is given the, um, uh, the instruction, there are other people with different mixes right. as well right. um just like uh, we all know when we go to the conference that we go to yeah um i still talk to people that i met last year at um um in the hyannis uh um conference uh wista fitchburg uh, i'm still in contact with them talking about different things and things that they're, they're, they're coming up with and what they've heard um so it's different people that you talk of you talk to you meet you network um, so I, I think that I understand, um, you know, it would be quicker and um, uh, more efficient to have mm -hmm. everybody taught here. But I think that there's an element that would be lost um, had we not send um, as many people as we can out to, to take the course. I agree. That's my personal opinion. I total agreement. So I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Moore. Uh, in reading the uh, whole thing here, and it talked about the breakout sessions. Mm -hmm. Now, when they have the breakout session, is it the breakout session, some of Great Law Group with some of other school groups, or was a breakout session yeah. with a different school? Your school. Yeah. So the way the conference was set up is that each day there was a keynote that everybody went to in a great big hall, right? right? And that was the important concepts that everybody need to learn needed to learn about. But the breakout sessions were geared more towards what your interest or your situation is, right? Okay. So if you're a math teacher, there was a breakout sessions on, on math, right? So, so everybody went to wherever their interests oh, okay. lied. In the, and then the breakout sessions is really when you got to know people from other school districts in the breakouts. And, and so then there was a, a, a session that was called team time where 
we got a room and we met as a team to talk about it was at the end to talk about what we've learned and you know you know what's important to folks and and how we're going to bring it back to the school so we actually spent uh, two hours doing that um, on the last day good yeah That's very good thank you up. outstanding okay the last piece of my uh, report is my annual evaluation uh, plan so um, the timeline for that uh, is for me this evening to give you a packet that has a self-assessment and end-of-cycle report from me okay and uh, also has um, an evaluation document in you for you to then evaluate me so based on on what you've observed of my performance based on what I'm going to provide you with regards to uh, data and things that I've accomplished so that you may or may not know about um, then you're going to do an assessment of me on my four goals and the four state learning standards uh, for superintendents or, or educational standards um, you need to have and also there's a, a flash drive in your packet right under your hand there um, so that flash drive has additional backup data um, that supports the things that I'm listing that, that I've accomplished. So you can put that into your computer and you can go in and, and you can take a look at that as well. Um, so there's a timeline now, September 17th, I'm, I'm providing you with the information. Um, by October 2nd, if you could please get um, that back to Cheryl. Cheryl's going to uh, collect it. Um, and she's going to take it and put it into a composite report um, that she's going to review with the with the chair uh, between the fifth and the thirteenth. She'll get that done. Um, on the fourteenth, there'll be a subcommittee meeting, uh, Mr. Bahu, Mr. Booten, and Mr. Espinola and Mr. Tatsios, where we're going to look at the composite uh, evaluation, the summary composite from based on the eight evaluations that you each perform. Um, and, and it's going to get shared with me, and we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about um, my presentation or my ideas around what the goals should be for next year. Um, so that at the, at the um, so that's going to be on October 14th, and then the com composite summative evaluations will be mailed out to you on the 23rd, and around the 29th, that's a tentative date, we would have a special uh, school committee member. The reason it's tentative is we have to find out who's available on that date. And if everyone's not available, we'll, we'll move the, the date around. But it'd be a special uh, meeting um, to go over the composite uh, with the full committee. Um, and I'll give you my plan for next year at that time so that you can approve it uh, moving forward. So this is new. This is the first year uh, the Department of Education changed their regulations so right through from every teacher and every administrator to the superintendent this is the process that we we need to follow and uh, that was a timeline we put together um, it is a new process so we're kind of learning by doing as we go through it but this is where we're up to in the process so okay I just want to mr. Who, here who set these goals up there? You guys set this up, then you yeah. the yeah. superintendent. <coughs> the goals were approved by you last September. Mm -hmm. I presented them to you. Okay, the plan. Right. The initial plan is in that packet, and also the revised plan yeah. from February. So the goals were presented to you. Uh, <coughs> voted to approve them. Um, there's a mid-cycle evaluation or mid-cycle report that I did in February, where we adjusted any of the goals that, that that needed to be adjusted. You then approved that, and now this is my report back to you on on how um, yeah. my evidence of, of how I, I performed uh, with regards to the goals and the four standards okay. during any, the year. Any other questions? Mr. Espinola? Part B of Mr. O'Hare's question. These um, timelines and dates, is that according to your contract? I wasn't here when they made your contract, so um, I'm not sure. Yeah, so or is this something that you would like to do, or is this something that we are contractually obliged to do? So when, when you approved my plan for last year, mm -hmm. there was a timeline in that plan. Now this timeline's been adjusted slightly because in the original plan, when we, the meeting in October, on October 15th, 
we were supposed to have everything done by. Okay, that was the original timeline. And um, the chairman, uh, through my secretary, uh, wanted to just put a little more time in there to be able to get it done, to give people more time to be able to get it back to Cheryl and then for us to meet. Um, so what we came up with was um, somewhere around October 29th, instead of having it completed by October 15th, somewhere around October 29th would hold a special meeting and that would give us a couple more weeks to get right, that, that, that was my point. Like, um, are we contractually obligated to these or like we can move around or somewhere like we, whatever. We can as long move as everything get, around. As long as we keep it moving. Yeah. And, yeah. And, we, and we get everything going in the right direction. Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, okay. one of the things from my perspective is that um, the idea by, behind having me give you this in September is I, a lot of the data and a lot of the evidence with regards to MCAS scores and those types of things, it's just becoming available now. Mm -hmm. So if I would have given you this stuff in July or August, I wouldn't have been able to give you a lot of the, the data, right? So that was the idea, and, and that was a suggestion by the Department of Ed that this is the time, a suggested timeline to follow. So by, by having it, at, and there's still two pieces of data that I have in the report that is, they're coming out September 21st. So the percentile ranking for our school and whether we're level one, level two, the accountability rating isn't out yet. Okay. So as soon as I get that, I will forward it to you. Right, but those are the only two and pieces. And your feeling is? So my feeling is that, 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 that you know, we're trending in the right direction and that Same thing should, that should look that way. From the information we've got tonight yeah. from your presentation that we should still be a level one school. We should, but it's a, ver it's a very complex formula. I know it is. Until they put it out. <laughs> but we're, we're being told tonight everything's I'll be going very surprised. fantastic. If, let me put it to you this way. If we're not, there's something wrong with their formula. Okay. <laughs> That's a different problem. Always a, a problem with the formula. That's a great answer, Mr. Superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Mr. Booth, question? Yeah, I just have a, a question about when we'll get the... Um, report from Ms. Goslin. Uh, you have between the 5th and 13th, you're going to comp compile that? Yeah. And then is it going to be given to us at the meeting, the 14th, or are we going to have time to review I'm hoping to have the compilation? I'm hoping to have enough time to get it to you before that meeting. You know, so I'm hoping that between maybe the 7th or the 8th, that it will be all done. Fred will have had time that's to look at ask. it. My, so and that's my concern. Like, I'm, I'm, like I'm to going to be that. away from the 8th to the 13th. Um, yeah, and I'll be away on vacation. I won't be um, doing any work. Ms. Goslin, could you send an email to Mr. Booten? So I won't be reviewing it on my vacation. I'm sorry. That's the holiday okay. weekend. That's right. That's right. that's it's Columbus Day weekend. So we may we may want to move the 14th meeting to the next week. Maybe is that what you're suggesting? Uh, that's fine. Yes. I mean, whatever we I, need to I do just, to flex I, this a little bit. I'm, is fine. I mean, I'm I can I'm on the that's subcommittee. I need to be there. We have some flexibility. It's Columbus Day weekend. There's some flexibility, but we're just trying to stay yeah. within. Yeah. You know, by, you know, get this completed by the end of October. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very are, familiar with the dates and, because you, know, you three are on the subcommittee, yeah, so you get so the calendar over there. That's why I'm see. saying. You know, I think I'm good with the following. So why don't we have the meeting? Your contract next week. I don't know. So why why don't we have the subcommittee meeting on October Monday, October nineteenth? Would that work? Nineteenth, he said. No, I'm back. I'm you going the eighth to the thirteenth. No, no, I, I know. Oh, I'm just yeah. trying to explain. And I don't have to do this around me, but where I'm on the subcommittee, I'd like to be involved. Does Monday, October nineteenth, work for you? It doesn't have to be. It's these. Oh, okay. It's me, Ray, and you. I'm okay. sorry. You said Monday. Monday, October nineteenth. Is that all right with you, Joe? Did, did yeah. Therefore, yeah, therefore, we could go ahead and have the uh, the summary sometime between October five and thirteen. We have about mm -hmm. a week and a half to go ahead and look at that mm -hmm. prior to the subcommittee meeting. And of course, everybody that's not on the subcommittee is invited to that subcommittee meeting. Well, we when we come back, I'll tell you what they're doing. Um, Maybe. The 19th? May 9th, um, oh, October right. 19th. The the subcommittee meeting yeah. on Monday, October 19th. <coughs> and we'll just have to set a time that works for everybody. You'll send out a nice electronic invite? Yes, as soon as I fine. know the time. Okay, and then the following week, then the oh. following week we could go ahead and have the summative evaluation report mailed to the school committee members, mm -hmm. which would bring oh, us to the, the week of October 20th. 
Whatever you want. Oh, wait for me. Okay. Time works for me. I just don't want that week. Well, let's say roughly by October 27th, which okay. will be Tuesday, October 27th. Can you make it 5 o'clock? Is it okay for you? No, he won't. He's it's just a subcommittee meeting. Just one second. 5 p.m. is okay with the three of us on the 19th? Is it okay with you? Yes. Yep. Okay. Then I will mail. Have two meetings. Then that Friday, if Five we have the special meeting the following week, I would be. I will mail out the report as soon as it's ready. It could be earlier than the 23rd if it's ready. Okay, so you can mail it to everybody. You don't just have to mail it to the subcommittee. Right. You can mail it to right. everybody. We mail it to everybody by the 26th. Yep. So by the 27th, is that where that'll work? Mm -hmm. so do we and when is the hold on? Excuse me. Meeting? I'm sorry. One one second, if you don't mind, no, Mr. Espinola. No, sure, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Whatever your wishes are. Thank you very much. Um, and then it comes down to the school committee conference. What, what, what is the date of that conference? That's, uh, is that November 4th, 5th, and 6th? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, we either have the um, subcommittee on Tuesday, October 3rd, Election Day, or the we regular, the special meeting. Special third, meeting. November, 3rd. November 3rd, my mistake. Thank you, Mr. Morin. So we're moving away from October 29th? It, it seems like. It seems like we're not going to have the, um, the summit of evaluation until October 24th. I, I think no. the summit of evaluation will be available on the 13th for everybody. Right. Not just for the, I mean, it's available for the subcommittee, subcommittee members. It can also be sent to all members on the 13th, right. so everybody can get it on the 13th. Why, why are you trying to separate it? You sent, you sent it all out that day, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's correct. It's getting yeah. sent out to this everyone. Is the, the first time through this process, so we're kind of. Okay. So, so the 19th is the subcommittee work. meeting. Mr. Booten, Mr. Complete? Espinola, Mr. Tatsis, as well as myself are on. And I, I know that. And then we will have a, and then everybody will get that summit of, even prior election. to that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even prior to that, is that correct? Yep. Like this. That's right. okay. And then it looks like we can still stay on target for that October 29th date and if. That's the CVS ribbon cutting, so they would be here anyway till 4.30. Yep. We could have the special meeting at 5. Is everybody comfortable with an October 29th special uh, school committee meeting? Sure. Special school Thursday. committee meeting. Um, Okay, Thursday, Thursday October 29th. When is your contract end? End of the year? June 30th, yeah. June 30th of this year. No, this year coming up. Next year? Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? The uh, composite summative evaluation report mailed to school committee members, mm -hmm. you're going to move that up? Yeah. Okay. It'll be mailed out by the 13th. If it's done sooner, it'll be mailed out sooner. Right. And it and will... And Cheryl can also email it because it's an electronic document. Okay. Mm -hmm. So besides sending it out by mail, we'll also send it. So if we have our subcommittee meeting on the 19th, that still gives us 10 days to, to before the meeting, before right. the special yes. meeting. Exactly. Yes. And CVS is on. When is the ribbon cutting for CVS? 29th. Uh, begins 2.30 to, to about 4 o'clock. Okay, so we're here anyway. So it comes down to that summative. If we could have it well before the 13th, realistically, I think, you know. Thank Five, you. six days to me is not a lot of time. Um, if we could have it the week prior to that, if I could kind of look at that. Um, is this what you previously gave us here? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, I just made copies yeah, of maybe the... Yeah, maybe by October uh, 9th, yeah, that'll give us a full... Uh, or the, October 20th, uh, that'll give us nine plan. days to yeah. go ahead and evaluate yeah. it. And it's yeah. also, yeah. all of the stuff yeah. that you have in there is have available on that stick as well. Yeah. Everything's on the date. stick. Okay. You'll have the subcommittee yeah. meeting on, on the 19th. This date, so I think already going to have Okay, got you. Right. So you know. still give you all that time. It's a lot of work went into that. What we need to do. Okay, so it looks like those dates... Nope, nope. The only thing is that we will be, I mean, when Cheryl collects the um, evaluations from you, um, she also needs to collect the stick because there is some confidential student information that's in, involved in some of the evidence. So um, just keep it confidential and she'll just uh, grab that from you when you turn that in. Facebook. I thought I was going to get to okay. keep that. You can, but we need to erase it first and then we'll give it back to you. <laughs> is it worth $50? No. Good. They're going to give to okay. Hillary. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you, Mr. Superintendent, <laughs> for a very detailed report, as well as all the good news that's happening here at Greater Lowell Tech. And now we'll move the meeting to our business manager. Is he still here? Amen. <laughs> Uh, 
Now, the first item I have in, it, in the packet is just an update for you um, on the financials, the, the reports that I'm preparing, the 2015 end of year report for the DESC, which is due October 1st. Uh, we're about 90, 95% complete, and I expect that to be submitted next week sometime. Um, the financial reports for the uh, Department of Revenue um, as part of the certification for the excess and deficiency that is done every year um, should be submitted tomorrow. I, I, I've uploaded a, a lot of the files and just got to get some signatures, so that'll be out. Uh, another report off and out of the way. Um, and the third item is the auditors uh, from Melanson Heath and Company are scheduled to come in the week of October 12th to do their field work um, as part of the annual audit for FY15. So I um, just wanted to update you on those three matters. Will you still be here, George? Yes, that'll, I'll be here that week, and that's why I wanted to be here to answer any questions and help uh, Billy Joe out as the, a transition. Uh, the second item uh, is a subject that has been broached uh, over the past few months uh, regarding the OPEB, um, which, as you know, stands for other post-employment benefits, uh, basically a district retiree health cost. You know, the past couple of years, the auditors have, uh, in their presentation, uh, have talked about the liability and the fact that districts and cities and towns have been establishing these uh, OPEB trust funds to start funding a portion of that liability each year. Um, in addition, rating agencies, uh, when, when you're going out to borrow funds, whether it's bonding or short term, they're looking at whether OPEBs have been set up to, uh, you know, at least identify that you've recognized the liability. So I think it's something, and I think the superintendent will agree, is uh, something that we, we should be really starting to take hold of. And uh, I identified basically the three steps to establish the trust. It's accepting the MG, Mass General Law, Chapter 32B, Section 20. Then uh, school committee adopting the declaration of trust, which we've already prepared and been reviewed by Attorney Long, and it's a similar boilerplate that other communities and uh, districts have used. Uh, and the third step is the, the funding part. And any funding would, would take place during uh, budget preparation. And when you present to the communities, a portion of that liability that you're funding will become part of your budget. Um, so. And, and that piece that is uh, appropriated is above your, your net school spending, so it would be an, a little additional. Um, and like I say, the soonest the district could appropriate would be for their FY17 budget. Um, I think it's something that we, we've got to address, and I, I would suggest you know, a finance subcommittee meeting to go through it in more detail, to be comfortable, um, and I'd like to hopefully be able to come back at the next meeting with the documentations for your consideration. A question, Mr. Booten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garabedian. I have uh, been working with Mr. Bahu to set up a, an appointment with the City of Lowell to discuss it with them. We're meeting sometime next week, probably on Tuesday, and uh, we'll, we'll be moving forward you know, with it. But we did want to speak to uh, city, the city officials first. Okay, uh, Mr. O'Hare? Yeah, um, are we going to be able to uh, carry OPEC money over from one year to another? Oh, what, what happens is you would appropriate whatever dollar amount you determine, and that will go into a trust. Yeah. And, and it would be separate from the district funds. And, and you, you could, you know, the, the treasurer is the custodian of the funds, but in a lot of the districts now have private um, investment companies that maintain and and uh, invest your funds and keeps them segregated. So as it continues, it's just going to keep growing and be reflected in your balance sheet for the uh, when the audit is uh, 
um, prepared each year. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, why are we going to the city of Lowell and asking the city manager? Yes, yeah, or the uh, treasurer. Not treasurer, sorry, chief financial officer. All right. To meet with them to discuss it. Okay, but that's not going to that's not going to affect. We don't have any liability for the city of Lowell, right? This is going to be strictly. Oh, this is this is our liability. Yeah, but we get we get funds from the city of Lowell, and I thought it would be the right thing to do to communicate to them that this is something we're going to move forward with. Yeah, Mr. O here, we just want to go ahead and speak to the um, uh, the business manager in the city of Lowell. Um, so that we could go ahead and make them aware that we will be adopting this thing and that we would like to go ahead and see how they're um, being funded by the state because they've adopted it, as well as the other towns um, should be um, considering maybe meeting or sharing if they so desire to um, let them know that we will be you know, taking care of this pension um, opportunity to have it funded by um, our ascending districts. So who who has this in law? Is it the <coughs> pension fund people or is it the city manager? I'm I'm not sure who manages their yep. contributions Indeed. or where they have it set up. But uh, I know they do have one set up, and I believe they put millions in, you know, a couple million dollars at least a few years ago into their uh, to cut, you know, as a contribution to the for their OPEB liability. Yeah. They put a significant amount in the savings in the uh, GIC. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Mr. Espinola. The million dollar question. What would be the amount recommended by you? Oh, that wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, a it, feasible it, amount, not, not well, what you think that's we should do. Well, that's up to the superintendent and, you know, at budget time, I think, um, whatever is palatable I think that y you want to you want to make an effort to fund it it's going to be it's a, you know a tremendous liability that but do at we least know how much we're deficient in it well it's not a deficient it's the accrued actuarial liability uh, from the I think last year it was like 73 million dollars just from us yeah that's for the whole country no, no, that's... That's just from us, our yeah. school. <laughs> $73 million. Yeah, that's that's the actuarial that's accrued liability over 30 <laughs> years. And and this uh, actuarial study is done every two years, so it's revised um, with updated uh, enrollment, you know, retirees, uh, health costs, contribution rates, etc. So the key that gets refined every two years. Right. It sounds like you got 30 years to get there. Well, I think what but Mr. I mean, Garabini is saying is, is anything is better than nothing exactly, because exactly. Uh, it, it makes us look like we're at least um, anticipating um, trying to um, address uh, the deficiency. The reality is, I don't think, I mean, to fund this in yeah, is, sure. is going to be unrealistic. I think recognizing that you do have a liability and that you adopt this and take steps yeah. that's um a big step well, and, and by doing that, that it affects the balance sheet and how the the numbers get reflected it come out of the general and they go into a you know a, another section on the balance sheet to to make it look favorable also sure and this is a state recommendation mr garabedian as well as all, this, all the communities are doing it in school districts um yeah. As well as a recommendation by our audit team. Oh Lewis yes, I mean they they were here in March and that's the only thing yeah. that they had that we were uh, deficient in. I think. Yeah, uh, it wasn't a was deficiency. I think it was. I mean, a couple of years ago when they brought yeah. the subject up, at that time, it was just a a, a discussion and they were booking it right. on your balance sheet and then it became more and more. Well, we got to start funding this now and so now the next year more more uh, news was on the fact that. Right. People have been establishing it, and whether it's a small amount or wherever, it's at least they've recognized it and they and they started to put something towards it. And I think on top of that, you put twelve cents in some wrong account last year. <laughs> I say. think. Uh, <laughs> did, I, I think <laughs> that's what you said. It killed me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
Next item. The next item. <laughs> next item is um, I have a list of transfers totaling $592,214. Um, I'm recommending uh, to transfer. And these are basically reallocation of grant funds. Um, when the when the grants were written, a majority of the funds, they were covering the salaries, but they weren't covering the fringe benefits. So the fringe benefits were coming out of the general fund. So in, in meeting with the superintendent, we wanted the grants to be more realistic so that the grants that were funding the salaries always and also took into effect the, the benefit costs that went with them. So to do that, it's just an adjustment shell game moving some funds from the different line items. I mean, I don't mean that in a shady way. <laughs> uh, and, and also, um, as the superintendent uh, mentioned in his presentation, there was some movement in, in staffing going to different departments. And so some of the monies that were being transferred are going from different departments to where that person moved to. They were, like one person was initially budgeted under guidance, when she now has moved under the ELL -L, uh, budget. So I'm moving the funds to the department that she's now under. So it's just a realignment. Okay. Uh, motion to approve. Sorry. By Mr. Morin. Seconded by Mr. Espinola. Roll call. Mr. Espinola. Yes. Mr. Bootin. Yes. Mr. LeMay. Mr. Warren? Yes. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Barber? Yes. Uh, the next item was just a response to a motion to um, school committee member um, Ray Booten regarding the uh, community eligibility provision. Um, this was brought up at the last meeting, I believe, and, and uh, I requested a response. Um, we did look at the um, program and utilize the um, calculator on the DESE website to see if it was uh, of benefit to us. And at this time, unfortunately, because of our direct certification of uh, free lunch is so low, um, financially it doesn't benefit us at this time. But it's something that we will continue to look at each year and in hopes of if, if the um, number of students that qualify for direct certification for free lunch increases, it, it may get to a level that it would be beneficial. Mr. Booten? So only 41% of our students are free? free Through the direct certification process. And then is it 61 or 62 percent that Over, are free and reduced? Yes, overall. That's through the application process and the direct certs. So okay. in total, it's about 61, 62 percent free and reduced. What does it need to be, like 78, I think, right? What, what is the percentage it needs to be? Well, well 53 the... 53 would be a break even. Yeah, right? the, the program, to be eligible for this um, program, and, and just to, cl to be clear for everybody, if this program basically allows districts to offer free lunch to everybody, all students, if the numbers work for them. Um, to qualify, the minimum is 40%. The district has to have 40% uh, direct cert. We're at 41, so we are on the low end of the qualifier. Um, districts that have a higher number of direct certs, it's beneficial because you don't have any administration, you don't have to deal with applications, and, and everybody has a free lunch, and the reimbursements you know, um, you know, keep the mm -hmm. keep the program in the, in the black. Um, this our numbers based on our um, percentage actually creates you know illustrates a loss of funds. Okay, Mr. Boot. So, another question: If we did switch to this, does this eliminate our a la carte menu that we have for the students? A la carte is though that's an additional. That's still a paid. Sandwich, yeah. yeah, I mean those are so those are extras. Still, so we would you, even if you went with this, you could still get <coughs> the students would still have that choice to mm -hmm. to buy extra things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you for the report. Thank you for the report. Question, question Mr. Uh, Moore. Yeah, a follow-up on uh, Mr. Booten's uh, uh, and, and Mr. Garabedian's uh, report is when, and I know the city of Lowell does this now, but I don't, I don't know the answer is, everybody gets a free breakfast and a free lunch yes. in the city of Lowell. Yes. But is it specified, this is your breakfast, this is your lunch? Yes. So if you don't like this, 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 there's not three. There's not three options. This is what you get. Yeah, right. So if, if so, maybe a lot of those kids don't take it anyways. Possible. And if you want to milk, you need to take the whole lunch, and throw away the lunch, and keep the milk. They won't just give you the milk. Yeah, they're, they're, they have requirements. There's there's nutrition mm -hmm. requirements. They have to provide a, a, like a right. milk, a juice, a fruit, uh, yeah. all these it's different components. Yeah. Uh, our wives work at the school, and my wife does the barter system all lunch long with kids who want, maybe one kid wants an extra milk, or maybe one kid wants another a meal, or whatever, instead of the yeah, kid. they barter against each other, the and, kids? And she's getting, okay, I'll give you another slice of pizza. You give uh, Sally the milk. Uh, instead of just going up, grabbing the whole lunch, take the milk, throw the lunch in the barrel. Or a share table. Yeah, where they'll, yeah you, you know, know like I'll give you my apple. milk, you give me a pizza. <laughs> yeah, the teachers in, in Lola are doing that, and, and it's it's kind of a crazy situation. It makes great sense, doesn't it? It does not make any sense whatsoever. As, as time goes on, we should, you know, maybe consider reevaluating it, but at oh, this absolutely. time, it's not the time to sure, adopt yeah. it for our school yeah. and right, thank we can, you. Um, move on with our meeting. But, I, Mr. Garabedi? I, I just had one more thing I just wanted to mention, uh, just as, as an FYI. My um, conf one of my confidential secretaries, uh, Karen Wiedek, is going to be retiring in January. Oh. And years ago, the school committee appointed her as the assistant treasurer and, and gave her a stipend. Right now, it's twenty five hundred dollars. With her going to be leaving, I'd like to come back in October with a recommendation that the pos the assistant treasurer function in the stipend go to my senior most confidential secretary which is Sue Reese who's the payroll coordinator uh, she's been with the district 34 years uh, a loyal dedicated and trustworthy uh, individual that I feel is uh, warrants um, the position she's a um, she knows a lot of the functions and I think having someone here that knows it is going to be an asset to Billy Joe when she comes and, and Karen leaves. So we'll need to get that done. I'd like to do it at the next meeting so that paperwork and with the banks and everything can occur over the, like, say, the month of November. The, the needs of the district would be better served to yeah. have the assistant treasurer be the senior confidential secretary, not the new one yeah. coming in. So George is going to be bringing a recommendation to... Uh, appoint uh, Susan as the as the uh, treasurer, tre assistant treasurer, assistant treasurer. Um, and therefore the new person that gets hired to take Karen's place will just be the confidential secretary. Um, but the senior person who's been here for 34 years is the one with the expertise that that we want as as the Absolutely. assistant treasurer. So um, I'll okay. make a motion that Mr. If, if George stays for six more months, I'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I make a motion uh, that we approve. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll bring that next. Motion. I just wanted to give you a heads yeah, up that, 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 that was coming next we, week. We can't so. tempt you with that twenty five hundred dollars stipend to stay on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not, not the Billy Joe. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next item will be anything under old business. Um, there are four outstanding items from previous meetings. I think they're all back to the agenda. Still there, so we'll just move move right along. Mm -hmm. um, new business. Um, we have a, a great little technical um, organization, day. teachers organization, um, side letter uh, to approve to amend the contract. And you see the amendment um, in the back of your miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. Is yes. Yep. Okay. In the back of your package this week, and I will read the actual amendment itself, um, taken directly from the Great Lowell Teachers Union contract. Um, I'll state the change. In recognition of regularity of professional service rendered as an incentive to the continued regularity of such service, 
Teachers who have served in the Great Lowell Technical High School for a minimum of 15 years and who have attained age 55 will upon resignation or retirement, which is where it ends, and I'm recommending and death from the district be paid an, an amount as indicated below of their unused sick leave accumulation as of the effective date of their resignation, retirement, and to add or death the amount of um, funds that they would go ahead and have their sick leave buyback be would be 20% of their total amount um, that they've accumulated during their lifetime here at Great Lowell Tech. Cap, capped at 225 days, right? And capped at 225 to days, exceed 225 which is stated days. in the contract. Mr. Uh, approval, moved to approval by Mr. Morin, seconded by Mr. Booten. Roll call. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. O'Hare. I just have to, <clears throat> you know, I think it's a great idea, but I just have to excuse myself from this because of my position. Okay. Okay. And it's also retroactive to July 1, right? Okay. And it is retroactive to July 1, I'm sure, as stated in the back of our package in the side letter. Okay. Um, motion, uh, roll call, please. Mr. Spinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? I'm not proving. And Mr. Bahu? Yes. Just your little bomb. Okay. Um, next is committeeman motions, and there are none this um, month. Um, and then it's to the <coughs> approval of our reports of subcommittees. Um, on the first one would be approval of August 20th, 2015, Great Lowell Technical High School Building Committee Report. So moved. Moved by Mr. Morin, second by Mr. Booten. Roll call. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Okay. Uh, entertain no a, monthly approval. Just no monthly approvals. I'd entertain a motion to um, adjourn. adjourn. Motion by Mr. Tatsi, a second by Mr. O'Hare. Roll call. Mr. Espinola? Yes. Mr. Booten? Yes. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Mr. Morin? Mr. Tatsi? Yes. Mr. Giggy? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. No.